Phillips' victory over the Illyrians was a decisive moment in his career. It gave him the confidence and the resources he needed to pursue his larger goals. And it marked the beginning of his transformation from a regional power to a major player on the world stage. Ian Worthington In 358 BC, King Philip II was riding high. He had just won a resounding victory over Macedonia's most bitter rival in Illyria, King Bardyllus. However, with a kingdom to build and more enemies on the horizon, Philip still had his work cut out for him. The king expanded his borders to reincorporate all of Upper Macedonia, which included some Illyrian-speaking communities. The Macedonians were starting to resemble a multilingual empire and the military turned into a tool of social transformation. Philip had proved that he had some ability as a military commander, but these gains were not guaranteed to last, and the 24-year-old monarch knew it. Philip realized that now was the time for diplomacy. To solidify his recent victories, he managed to arrange five marriages over the course of the next three years. This was marriage as policy, not for love, although it's possible that Philip felt some affection for some or all of his wives. One of his wives, Audita, gave Philip a daughter, Sinane, who became a warrior and led an army into battle after the death of Alexander. Another wife gave him a son named Philip Aridaeus, who would later become important but was also mentally handicapped. The most important of his wives was a woman named Olympias, the mother of Alexander the Great. After consolidating his recent gains, Philip turned his attention back to strategy. Macedonia had a long-running conflict with Athens, and the king knew that he had to secure his coastline from invasion. Philip decided he had to take the city of Amphipolis in 357. The city's defenses were nearly impenetrable, and they had access to the sea, which made the city easy to resupply. Standard practice at this time was to surround the target city and starve the inhabitants, but this wouldn't work if Amphipolis had access to the sea. Defying convention, Philip decided to launch a direct assault on the city. He recruited a large corps of engineers and brought in a large amount of artillery. The defenders put up a fierce resistance and the siege became a contest of wills. Eventually, it became clear that the city would fall. The citizens of Amphipolis, desperate to save their city, sent two envoys to the city of Athens and begged for help from their old enemy. Athens decided against war with Philip and instead sent two ambassadors to negotiate with him. He gave vague assurance of peace to the Athenians. As the summer wore on, Philip's battering rams finally took down a section of the city wall. The Macedonians stormed into the city. The Greeks expected the fall of a city to be accompanied by massacres, rape, and the enslavement of the survivors. Philip shocked everyone, though. Even if the siege was brutal, once he had possession of the city, he was unusually lenient. Those who led the opposition were exiled, but those who remained were safe, and they were allowed to keep their property. The city was absorbed into Philip's kingdom, but was allowed to function on a day-to-day -day basis under its own laws and institutions. Philip's growing power was starting to unnerve his neighbors. The Illyrians, led by King Grabus, were preparing to return to war with Macedonia. They were joined by the Paeonians, led by King Lypaeus. Another man named Sintriparus, who controlled a third of the Thracian tribes, saw his chance to strike a decisive blow and joined with the other two to form a triple alliance against Philip. Philip sent Parmenio, a trusted friend and general, with an army to confront the Illyrians, Macedonia's deadliest foe. The king took the rest of his forces south to lay siege to the city of Potidia to fulfill his agreement with the Chalcidians. This was a city that had withstood a two-year blockade by Athens during the Peloponnesian War, so this would be no easy feat. After a year of triumphs, it was said that Philip received three messages in a single day. The first message brought news of Parmenio's triumphant defeat of the Illyrians. The second was to announce the victory of Philip's horse at the Olympic Games. The third message he received would change the course of history, the birth of a son named Alexander. In just a few years as king, Philip had doubled the size of his kingdom and increased its wealth substantially. 
The days of fighting with his back against the wall were now behind him, and it was clear that a new age was dawning in Greece. Eventually, Philip found himself drawn into what's known as the Third Sacred War, which was a pan-Hellenic conflict which involved multiple city-states. One of the main combatants was the city of Larissa. Since he had an alliance with Larissa, Philip knew intervention in the conflict would be necessary to secure his reputation for reliability. Even though the potential gains were significant, there isn't any evidence that Philip had a deeper plan for the domination of Greece. The war isn't well known or documented, but it was an important event in Philip's life, so we'll recount it as best as we can. In ancient Greece, there was an association called the Delphic Amphictyonic League, a pan-Hellenic religious organization which governed the most sacred site in Greece, the Temple of Apollo at Delphi. In 357, it was the city of Thebes who dominated the league, and they wanted to punish the city of Phokis for past transgressions. They imposed a large fine on the Phokian confederation for the crime of cultivating sacred land. For good measure, Thebes also levied a fine on Sparta for occupying their city some 25 years previous. The Thebans knew that the fines were unjustifiably harsh and figured that when Phokis refused to pay, they would be justified in launching a sacred war against them. The Phokians held a conference to decide their course of action. Philomelus advocated a policy of seizing Delphi and asserting the ancient claim of Phokis to the presidency of the Amphictyonic League. This way, they could use their newfound power to annul the fines on themselves. The Phokians voted in favor of this proposal, and Philomelus was appointed strategos autocrator, or general with independent powers, by the Confederacy. His closest supporter, Onomarcos, was appointed strategos, second in command. The Strategos knew that he couldn't conscript all of Phokis to fight and decided to build a large mercenary army. In July of 356, he marched on the city of Delphi, taking the sanctuary of Apollo. Philomelus got to work securing his position in Delphi. He destroyed the stones which recorded the verdict against the Phokians and abolished the government of the city. He ordered the sanctuary to be fortified and a large limestone wall was constructed. He then sent emissaries to all the Greek states, asserting the Phokian claim to Delphi. The oracle had over time accumulated vast treasuries, but Philomelus promised not to touch this wealth if his claim was recognized. The Spartans endorsed his claim, since their fine had been annulled. Athens also expressed support, given their general anti-Theban foreign policy. Elsewhere, his emissaries were met with failure. The Thebans sent out their own envoys, suggesting that a sacred war be declared against Phokis. Most states supported this position, and the war was called. It was too late in the year to start a campaign, but promised that the following year the war would commence. On hearing the news, Philomelus was aware that he needed a substantially larger force, so he hired more mercenaries. The only way he could do this would be to plunder the accumulated wealth of Apollo. It is estimated that the Phokians spent some 10,000 talents of Apollo's treasure during the war. Philomelus had to increase the pay of the soldiers by half in order to overcome their reluctance to fight for a sacrilegious cause. The next year, Philomelus made the decision to go on the attack. His rationale was that if he could defeat the various armies assembling against him one by one, he stood a much higher chance of victory. Eventually, the Amphictyonic army, led by Philip's old Theban host Pamenes, defeated Philomelus on the slopes of Mount Parnassus. The survivors tried to escape up the mountain, and Philomelus himself was injured. Rather than risk capture, he threw himself off the mountain, falling to his death. Onomarcos, who was second in command, managed to salvage the remainder of the army and retreated back to Delphi. Pamenes, believing the Phokians had no choice but to sue for peace, returned to Thebes. Rather than surrender, Onomarcos rallied the Phokians, and they decided to continue the fight. The stakes were as high as they could possibly be, since nothing less than total victory would secure their future. His position secure, Onomarcos had his chief opponents arrested and executed and confiscated their property to add to his war chest. He doubled the size of his army to 20,000 men and 500 cavalry. 
The war ignited old rivalries in Thessaly, and the city of Larissa appealed to Philip of Macedon to help them defeat their old nemesis in the city of Pharae, who had sided with Phocis. And so Philip marched his army into Thessaly, intent on attacking Pharae. Onomarchos received word of Philip's arrival, marched his own army into Thessaly to meet him, and actually inflicted two defeats on Philip. After these setbacks, Philip retreated to Macedonia for the winter. He is said to have commented that he did not run away, but like a ram, I pulled back to butt again harder. Philip returned to Thessaly the next summer with a new army. He requested that the Thessalians join him this time around. Philip now had an army of 20,000 infantry and 3,000 cavalry, roughly equal to the army of Onomarcos. Athens, sensing an opportunity to weaken Philip, sent an army under the command of Cares to aid the Phocians. Onomarcos marched to meet Philip once again, and the two armies met in the city of Pegasae. Philip sent his men into battle wearing crowns of laurel, the symbol of Apollo, as if he was the avenger of sacrilege, and he proceeded to battle under the leadership, as it were, of the god. The Battle of Crocus Field, as it became known, was one of the deadliest battles in ancient Greece. Philip won a decisive victory against Onomarcos. In total, 6,000 Phocian soldiers were killed, including Onomarcos, and another 3,000 taken prisoner. In the aftermath of the battle, the Thessalians elected Philip as Archon of Thessaly. Uniquely in ancient Greek history, the Phocians were able to absorb huge losses in manpower due to their plundering of Apollo's treasure. Even after their loss, the Phocians elected to continue the war, and they regrouped under the leadership of Onomarcos' brother, Phalos. The war would continue for a couple more years, but Philip wouldn't involve himself in this phase of the conflict. However, it was clear that the sacred war could only be ended by outside intervention, since the Phocians had occupied several Boeotian cities, but they were starting to run out of treasure to pay their mercenaries. The king of Macedonia knew he would have to end the war, but he would only do so on his terms. Philip first had to secure a peace, or at least a truce, with Athens. They and Macedon had been at war since 356, and their bilateral war had been engulfed by the Sacred War. The Athenians were also hard-pressed, and it was they who initiated peace talks with Philip, and they sent an embassy to discuss peace with him. This embassy was composed of ten leading Athenians, including Philocrates, Demosthenes, and Aeschines. Philip received them graciously, and both sides presented their terms for peace. The emissaries returned to Athens to present the proposed terms, along with the Macedonian diplomats, empowered by Philip to finalize the agreement. On the 23rd of April, the Athenians swore to the terms of the treaty in the presence of the Macedonian ambassadors. After agreeing to the peace terms with the ambassadors, the Athenians dispatched a second embassy to Macedon to extract the peace oaths from Philip. They traveled at a relaxed pace to Pella, knowing that Philip was away on campaign in Thrace. When they arrived, the Athenians were surprised to find embassies from all the principal combatants in the Sacred War present in order to discuss settlement in the war. When Philip returned to Pella, he received the Athenians along with the other embassies. They formed two groups. On one side were the Thebans, along with the Amphictyonic League. The other side consisted of Phocis, Athens, and Sparta. Philip heard both sides. He didn't commit to one side or the other, but promised both sides that he was strongly considering their proposal. Philip, meanwhile, was mustering his army. He told the ambassadors that this army would be directed at Halas, a small Thessalian city which held out against him. He departed for Halas without taking any oaths, forcing the Athenians to travel with him. Only when he reached Pharae did Philip finally take the oaths, enabling the Athenians to return home. It was now that Philip applied the coup de grace. He had secretly sent a small force to garrison Thermopylae, the only pass into southern Greece. By the time the Athenians were home, Philip was in possession of the pass. Now all of central and southern Greece was at Philip's mercy, and Athens couldn't save Phocis even if they abandoned the peace treaty. The Athenians realized their position was hopeless, 
and passed a motion reaffirming the peace treaty. Philip dictated terms to the rest of Greece. Phocis was surrendered to him, and in turn Philip announced that he would not sit in judgment of the city, but instead the Amphictyonic League would pass that sentence. The terms imposed on Phocis were harsh, but not as harsh as some other cities wanted. The city of Phocis was to be demolished, the people to be resettled in unwalled cities of no more than 50 houses each. The money stolen from the temple was to be repaid at the rate of 60 talents per year. Lastly, their two votes in the Amphictyonic League were stripped and handed over to Macedon. The Athenians were not punished since Philip signed a separate treaty with them and Sparta got off lightly. Philip presided over the Amphictyonic festival in the autumn and to the surprise of many Greeks returned to Macedonia and did not return to Greece proper for seven years. He did, however, garrison Nicaea, the closest town to Thermopylae. Philip had not yet turned 40 and he was on the precipice of controlling all of Greece. The scale of his achievements shouldn't be downplayed just because we know what comes after his death. He had accomplished more by this time than any other Macedonian and his kingdom was looking more secure by the day. He had two sons by this point, one of them being the future conqueror of the Achaemenid Persian Empire.